present are finding themselves in those environments, they're going to do what conditions A plus B require. And that would require that that particular mass flies off. That that bond and that bond are simply erased by your eraser. Don't use a substitute pen. Erase it with your eraser. And then you're suddenly going to have a bunch of atoms that don't have the right number of bonds. That's what hydrolysis is. One option gets a hydrogen, the other option gets a hydrogen, and the chin of the mass gets the carbon back. So if I were to ask what the hydrolysis product of that molecule would be, or better, I guess, the hydrolysis of that molecule would be, then you'd be able to come to all the important organic molecules that would be created as a result of hydrolysis. And simply, again, erasing the bonds to the carbon mass oxygens, giving them the two hydrogens of water, the carbon of carbon gets its oxygen back. And that's the easy game to play. You can predict it's not right, but it's just an easy game to play. So biologically, we have a very similar game going on with the molecule at the top called glucose. You can see here glucose is in an equilibrium with itself, which provides us another form of glucose. Both of them are biologically active. Both of them get this active energy. And these two are the only ones that exist in the natural world. And you can see there are another form that we can actually produce called the enantiomer. But it does not exist in the natural world. And so we find that our bodies respond to sugars of a certain type of stereochemistry. And our bodies only respond to certain amino acids and their stereochemistry. Amino acids obviously being important because of the protein and enzymes. So in looking at this, what we're basically saying, those two molecules are different. They're in an equilibrium with one another, but they are different. And if you take the pure form of the mob of glucose on the left hand side and put it into water and shine it a polar inverse, or a polar inverse about which way it was a plane polarized by the pen, lens to the right, we call it extra rotatory positive in terms of sign, and if it's deeper rotatory, we say it bends to the left, it's negative in sign. And at no point do we ever know what a molecule will do in terms of its bending until we do the experiment. Done the experiment, the only thing we can say at that point is it's an antimer or it's mirror image will do the exact opposite, the exact same opposite extent. So if it bends, one thing bends to the right by 20 degrees, the enantiomer has to bend to the left by 20 degrees. And so using polarimetry is a very good diagnostic for knowing the concentrations of molecules that are in the system, they are present in their non pure form. So if you take this molecule on the far left hand side, it actually will bend light to the right by a certain amount. And you take a pure molecule on the right hand side, on uh, the right hand side, I mean. Uh, the left hand side will bend at a certain amount, the right hand will bend at a certain amount. And it turns out they both bend them to the right, because these are not enantiomers. So we don't have any kind of automatic if they're not. But what eventually happens is you look at the polar the, the data starts changing, and eventually it comes to an equilibrium value. And no matter which one you start off with a pure value, it ends up coming out to that same exact number. So knowing that, we can figure out composition of each one is. And from our equilibrium era, we're saying the one on the left-hand side is more biologically dominant than the one on the right-hand side, just from the era itself. If I were to ask you to give you a good reason why that would be, thinking about this basic structure, your only way to go about doing it. I've been looking at the two molecules for a while and say, man, everything about it is the same, except one carbon position. This one where the mass carbonyl is located. In some cases, the mass carbonyl has its OH, which will eventually turn into an oxygen, turn into an OH that's in its equatorial position. And over here, the, the carbonyl oxygen eventually gets transformed into an oxygen position. That's it. So based on that one piece of evidence alone, if you were to say that the one on the left-hand side is more stable than the one on the right-hand side, and therefore that's why the equilibrium moves to the left-hand side over the right-hand side. It may not be the right reason, but it serves a good reason. I think it's perfectly fine. There are a lot of reasons why that's the case, but that would be a really good reason. And it works. So what's so special about that carbon, and what's so special obviously about that carbon, is that it is the only place where the two molecules are interchanging with one another. And I don't know about you, but I don't really see the opportunity for the molecule to lose OH and nitrogen in space and then coming around the opposite sides as being the mechanism. It's as if the molecule in its ring form going to a different ring form completely. And what we know about the oxygen atom here, and this little half mass, is that this oxygen here, if we erase that bond and put a hydrogen, that's water. Erase that bond and put a hydrogen there, that's an alcohol. Then that's the carbon that has the carbonyl. And what would that carbonyl group be? Now what? We know about alkyls, it's there a 
us as it's OH and it's coming into the ally, it can either come in from above, knocking the carbonyl oxygen down, or it can come in from underneath, knocking the carbonyl oxygen up. Those are the two options. That's what the two faces of the carbonyl combine. That's what we talked about quite a bit over the last couple of days. So in order for those two molecules to be generated through an equilibrium, there must be a point where the molecule has to be in some kind of open chain form. Another piece of evidence that suggests that's the case, again, here's the heavy acid tablet with smiley face mask. And we'll talk more specifically about what that kind of part is called as we define the relationship of these two molecules. Right now, the relationship between these two molecules, as you can see, would be diastereomers. That's the only relationship that you can come up with. Everything about the connectivity of the molecules is the same. The only thing that differs is a group in its position in space. That's what stereoisomers are. And as you go around the molecule, the OH group, all these other chiral centers are exactly the same. But we are changing one of the chiral centers only. So that is not the basis of the mirror image. In answer, that's the basis of the diastereomer. But there's a, a, there is a chemical connection between these two molecules, so they take on some other length. Kind of like keto and enol. We can call them constitutional isomers. But there's a chemical equilibrium that connects them, so we call them quantums instead. So if you add hydrogen metal to this glucose structure, you produce a molecule that everybody has probably seen one time or another in their life. If you pay any attention at all to the ingredients in the back of the labels that have sugar-free containers, especially if you're diabetic, you're obviously conscious of that. And so the picture I'm going to show you here is not one to write down. If you want to write down the word sorbitol and look it up later, that's fine. But it's not necessary. Illustrate the point that if you add hydrogen metal to this molecule, for it to end up becoming a string when it first started off as a ring, it would mean that the molecule at some point would have to open to accept those hydrogens. Because there's no place where you would recognize H2 collapses together. And if you go back to your workbook, this is the first chemical reaction that I asked you to go through and evaluate the body by those type of people. And didn't even really do it because there's a lot right over your head. Well, now's a really good time to go back and look at it. Because this is where we are. And the whole idea is that in order for a molecule to be saturated by hydrogen metal, which has a pi bond, this molecule doesn't have a pi bond. So at some point, the pi bond must be there. And then when it changes itself, it's no longer capable of reclosing because the pi bond is gone. You can actually do the same exact thing now based on our current information using sodium boron hydride, lithium aluminum hydride. They would work too, although lithium aluminum hydride. You can see all those protons go away from that. But the idea is that the sodium borohydride is selective created for aldehydes and ketones. So for sodium borohydride to turn a molecule that does not have an aldehyde or ketone into something new, it means that someone that the aldehyde or ketone must be there. Another piece of evidence that allows us to go to this Another piece of evidence that recognizes the difference between aldehydes and ketones we talked about already is oxidation. And it turns out that aldehydes are not oxidized and ketones can't. So that's the one distinction we have, and I know I've mentioned that two or three times. There was a time not too long ago. When I take the old days, I mean, like, you guys were my age, when I, I was your age. Uh, if, if you wanted to know how to get too much sugar in your blood, how would you go about doing it? How sophisticated and you know, the of the day? Just take the serum, stick to the machine, and walk away, go eat a good cup of coffee. We actually had to do some kind of manipulation. I 
I can do that. I don't know why you're here. I came here because I couldn't do anything. <laughs> <laughs> Take some initial weeks of faith. 